Well, this morning we have a, a very serious discussion, and uh, I hope that we can put a few ideas across <clears throat> that will be helpful in the future. At the present time, we have a world narcotic problem in which cocaine and heroin and marijuana are now acknowledged to be out of control. In other words, there isn't enough uh, agencies, there are not enough operators to curb this situation. And there are all kinds of attitudes as to what we're going to do about it. What people don't seem to realize is that these addictions are, we might say, to the physical body of society. But they are the direct result of three other powerful narcotics that we don't hear anything about. They, these narcotics are uh, habit forming and will ultimately be fatal to individuals, nations, and the world. And these habit forming drugs on the psychological level are wealth, fame, and fun. We are living for nothing else but. We are losing sight entirely of the seriousness of the problems which we face. We are looking forward with great hope to a new way of life for all of us. We want to see that the various climatic conditions through which we have recently passed are proofs that we're coming through to something better. I'm inclined to favor this but I think the problem is bigger than the average individual realizes. In the first place, a lot of people still believe that these problems, or this major problem, can be legislated. That laws can be passed by means of which certain excesses will be curbed. Actually, laws have been passed on every subject, and the lawbreaker is better off than ever before. We cannot do it by law. We have to do it by individual integrity. The only way out of the present dilemma is that citizens in their personal lives will begin to live the things they talk about and the things they believe and the things they would like to hear legislated. We are at the present time in a condition in which we are becoming aware of some of the perils that we face. We are in the presence of a mass of exposures in which persons trusted with various responsibility have been proved unworthy. We are faced constantly with the catastrophes of international relationships. We are still hoping that politics will take care of the situation. But unless politics is supported by the private citizen, it will not and the things which politics will do of its own accord will help very, very little. We must begin to recognize that all of these major changes depend upon individuals voluntarily assuming programs of self-discipline. We've got to improve our personal way of life. We have got to stand against policies which we do not believe to be correct. To do this is going to be expensive. The average person is living beyond the world's means. He is living on a higher level than humanity as a whole can maintain. We are living to exhaust our natural resources with no thought of what we will do when they were gone. We hope, however, that someone will invent a substitute for anything we run short of. This is also more or less a forlorn hope because we're gradually running short of everything. We are on a little ball floating in space. This little ball is a bottle 8,000 miles in diameter and beneath its surface, on its surface and the air above its surface are all the values which we need to endure. We are not protecting these values. We are exploiting them to the last nickel. We want to cut down nothing that interferes with luxury. And as the old Greek philosopher said, if you want to curse your son, 
say to him, I hope you live in luxury. This is our problem. We are building more cars and the roads won't take care of the ones we have. Everything is becoming more so. Cities that were supposed to hold, hold a half a million now have five or ten million inhabitants. Everything is being exhilarated except solution. And solution is left to heaven by people who don't even believe in God. This is uh, the uh, very serious situation. Something that has to be given a lot of consideration. Now we are all here on a temporary passport. From here to there we all go. And whatever we do here is of no value to us there unless it has done something to make us better people. The afterlife as from Egypt, Greece and all ancient nations was a sphere of rewards. Good rewarding good. Ill rewarding ill. So we can take nothing with us but our integrities. And we're going to many travel light on that basis. <laughs> so, if we want to solve these problems and make this peace a reality that we hope for, individuals have got to make sacrifices. They must make dedications and keep them. They must conserve resources. They must restrict expenditures. Now they say that if we do these things, it will result in economic bankruptcy. Too late. We're there already. But if we want to put what we can into the building of a new way of life, we will realize that all of these ills were the result of our own basic wrong thinking. This world was given to us to use. We've abused it. It was given as a place of learning, and we have rejected learning on every possible count. We were told that we are able to live in this garden as stewards and servants of an eternal principle. We have changed the whole thing, paved the garden, and sold it as condominiums. We have done everything we could to destroy the planet on which we live. We have wrapped it in a, ty in a tirade of wars. We have given every consideration to armed and military progress and very little to peace. All of these situations arise from a personal ambition or avarice, they arise from the, con uh, the concept that wealth is secure. The recent debacle on the stock market might help a little bit to recognize that this is not true. We are looking for truths, and we do not find these truths in the social system which we are desperately attempting to maintain. And in order to maintain it, we are now forced to gradually weed out the few truths that we did leave and discard them because they appear to interfere with the correction of the situation. So we are now right down to the point, do we want peace? Do we really want to have a world at peace? Or do we want to have an arbitration of violence in which each individual can settle down and exploit his neighbor without any probability of redress? Are we willing to make the changes that are necessary. We talk today as we have not for 50 years on the importance of the teachings of Jesus. We are also very convinced that the brotherhood of humanity is possible. And yet we make no dynamic effort. We talk about it, we write about it, we listen to it, but if it costs money we are not present at that moment. We don't want to sacrifice anything. We want a world of peace in which everybody is rich. Well, the world wasn't built that way. Wealth was a human institution. The universe gave us what we need, and we have spent thousands of years trying to transform that into what we want. And our wants continue to grow, and the materials to satisfy them continue to diminish. We are confronted by a crisis that will certainly be faced within the next 10 or 15 years. We are gradually building toward a recognition that we have abused and misused 
each other, the world in which we live, and the teachings that have been given to us to help us straighten out the mess. Everywhere, avarice has interfered with principles. The hope of fame has dominated the desire to live an honorable life. And the young people growing up in an uncontrolled society have decided there's nothing to look forward to, so let's have fun today and die tomorrow. This type of thinking is never going to be a solution, and no election can correct it. The correction lies directly with us. We must begin to recognize the difference between use and waste. We must realize that in a world in the condition this one is in, we cannot have three or four automobiles in one family. We cannot continue to expand and expand. We must gradually get to the point where we cooperate for decent survival. Now, we're not going into politics. That is not my field. But I would like to hope that if people become intelligent, their politicians will inevitably improve. We will also be able to select from enlightened people for public office. But we cannot do that so long as they can bribe their way into practically any state they wish. Nobody seems to interfere as long as the process does not interfere with the individual himself. And when he is interfered with, a great hue and cry goes up, but nothing changes. So I'm suggesting a very serious point in connection with the next 15 or 20 years. We see around us the arising of a new order of life. We see more people than ever, in, certainly in my lifetime, has ever seen before, trying to do something to solve things. There are people in every business, every walk of life, who believe in better principles. Wherever such people exist, we have to help them. We have to cooperate with their principles. And we must try to find ways to make sure that these individuals are not abused and misused for the profit of someone else. Actually, we have a series of adjustments. We have in our heads a thing called the brain. We have in our bodies a thing called the heart. These two have got to work together in a cooperative for the first time. A few individuals have achieved this union, but not many. Those who have achieved it we regard as the great heroes of life, but we do not emulate them. We respect them, we admire them, we read about them, and we ignore them. We ignore the message that they bring. Well, now we can start with our own little problems. We all want to be better people. We all want to improve social conditions. We would like to overcome poverty and vice. We would like to have young people something to live for better than rock music. We'd like something that shows progress. The most advanced culture the world has ever known scientifically and industrially is falling apart morally, and its ethics are becoming more and more dubious. We must rescue the world before we permit negative factors to take over. If we do let this happen, the retribution of universal law is bound to be very heavy. We want to get in line with the facts. We want to live according to the law and not against it. And when I say law, I do not mean man-made law. I mean divine law. And all human law that is important is based upon divine law. When it departs from divine law, it departs from its own ethics. It, de it denies its own purpose and it destroys its own objectives. So we are now looking to see what we can do as individuals. One thing we can do is we look over our own uh, economic and social position. What are we doing with the money that we have? Are we doing anything to help society or are we wasting it on fun and having no fun? We go home from the great fun adventure to a condition that is not pleasant in any sense of the word. The individual should learn to live moderately so that he can succeed in being a comfortable and secure person. <coughs> Poverty is insecure. Great wealth is insecure. 
between these two is moderation. And Socrates said, in all things, not too much. We have too much poverty and too much wealth, and they're not properly balanced in the correction of an economic system. Now, if we look at the little planet going on through space, well, and we are captives on it, each generation that comes and goes is floating through space on this little ball. None of the past generations are still with us. The future is still unborn. And here we go, floating along in space on a very definitely limited planet. We are not on a planet that can fulfill everything. Our leaders in various fields tell us we don't need to have a planet that fulfills everything because we can create devices by means of which we can take care of the erosions that are taking place in our natural resources. In other words, we're going to invent something when everything else fails. When the oil gives out, we're going to invent something else. When the uh, when electricity is exhausted, we'll do something about that. When we have no more wood, we'll do something about that. We're always going to do something to clear up smog, to clear out uh, b various forms of refuse which we do not know what to do with all these things are sort of trying to take care of themselves as a matter of fact they're not taking care of themselves and those appointed to do it don't know what to do about it either each individual must do what he can to reduce the burden of his own attitudes and appetites and ambitions upon the planet in which he lives we have only a comparatively small sphere we are already populating up to six million, uh, six billion, and we will continue. But it's fortunate that the planet itself is well able to take care of it, but is not able to take care of it if everybody fulfills all their selfish desires. We cannot make a planet in which six or seven billion people all have everything, because it wasn't intended that for. We are here on trial. We are here, in a sense, being initiated into the mysteries of life. This planet is a kind of esoteric school where we learn to grow, where we learn to become better human beings, where, the, where we pass tests instead of flunking them. We have failed to provide the necessities for protecting our only physical home right here. Our education is not teaching the young to protect natural resources. It is not instructing those of somewhat older years in the proper administration of employment. It is not giving any instruction to those who are trying fer fervently to end the destructiveness of militarism. And it is doing nothing to cause the, you know, accomplish the prevention of crime. And the whole theory of punishing the misdeed is not the solution. The solution is to cause a better level of life by which we do not have these misdeeds that we must get over all the time. We look around and see what is happening. We read the daily paper. I read a little bit at least every day, all I can stand. And <laughs> as a result of that, it becomes evident that almost everything we don't like is flourishing. Everything we know is wrong is increasing in importance. Governments are in trouble. Leaders are in trouble. Everyone is in trouble. But for some mysterious reason or way, the average person simply settles back and is sure it cannot happen to him. No matter what happens, he will be able to maintain the fallacies which have dominated his life. We are going to finally find out that salvation is not a collective experience. It is not something that is dropped from heaven. Salvation must be earned. The A word salary comes from the same root as salvation, which means salt. And the salt of the earth in ancient times was the symbol of the wise, the, the, the knowing ones, the ones who could take co a common experience and give that experience a certain flavor by which it became acceptable to millions of people. So we are now in the condition where we have to begin to practice some of the virtues necessary to an individual or a family living in a highly restricted area, the planet Earth. 
We are here and we hope to remain for the present. But nature is a very vulnerable and mysterious creature. And one of the things we're gradually discovering about nature is that our thinking has a lot to do with what happens. The individuals who group together to maintain a situation add a mental de definitive to it by means of which we can precipitate things. If we think bad enough, we can get in more trouble. If we think a little better, we can relieve ourselves of some of our difficulties. We've got to learn to think straight, live straight, believe in the truth, and stand up for what our, we know to be principles. And the time is now. Also, it is encouraging, very encouraging, to realize that a great many people think the same way. And little by little, there are groups rising up all over the world determined to end this riot of dissipation with which we have passed and especially the last 50 years. It's in the last 50 years our troubles have multiplied, our skills have increased, our population has grown, and our ethics have fallen apart. This is one of the things that we've got to work on. Now we've got people who are trying to put together a, pack, a program for helping this situation. But they are also in difficulties. The moment they try to do something, somebody rises up and says, who's going to make profit off of this? We're going to raise these funds, but why don't we just divide them among ourselves? This is the type of thinking we are using every day. The purposes for which we are trying to gather our resources are not receiving the strength that we intended them to attain through our cooperation. We've got to begin to demand integrities. We have to have the gumption to turn away from that which is dishonorable. And we have to teach our children the same thing. And we have to go out into various streams of business, and if the job demands dishonesty, we've got to look for another job. If we expect it to waste, if our children have gradually been taught to be spendthrifts, we've got to re-educate them. The time is to prepare, if possible, for what has been anciently prophesied, namely that by the end of the present century, the Great Reformation will take place. Uh, Nostradamus told us that after the end of this century, the Paraclete, or the Prince of Peace, would come. So we have to prepare an appropriate environment for peace. We have to be ready to accept brotherhood, love, friendship, and kindness as the basic principles of our relationships. Up to now, for a long time, they've not even been considered. Individuals who have tried hard have been badly hurt, and for the majority, the condition has remained the same. But now, if we want this peace, or if we want to be ready for it, if we want to stand prepared to live in a better world, let us think for a minute what that world might be like. Remember, that world isn't something in which we can exploit the natural resources. There is talk about trying to colonize another planet, but uh, I think we need more consideration for uh, colonizing this one with the right kind of people. We, not, we cannot depend upon mysteries of this nature. If it could be they could be depended on, the moral and ethical value of humanity would be lost. Humanity is here to grow, and to grow means to mature, to have greater and higher, nobler, and more permanent aspirations, to learn the lessons of life. The ancients had their mysteries, institutions in which they admit, admitted the worthy with certain probationship and testing and trial in order to fit themselves for higher responsibilities. In the last analysis, this world is a mystery school. It is a school in which we are here in order to pass an examination. And it makes no difference what happens to anyone else in the sense of it affecting us. The examination for us is for us, and we are the ones who must meet it. And each individual who wishes to be part of a better way of life must make a definite contribution toward that end. So we are here to grow and to get ready for another century. And there are indications, there are landmarks, 
there are indications definitely that people are getting together to do this. They are trying. They are working together. They are in trouble because they do not have any background of experience to work from. Most of those who are now trying to do it better had no help from for doing it better except the misfortunes in their own lives. They have, some of them have gotten tired of misery, gotten tired of jealousy, hates, gotten tired of superficial living that ends in nothing but uh, intoxication and death. People out of their own sorrows are beginning to grow towards the realization that this world was a beautiful place until we ruined it and that we've got to restore it before we can ask for the grace of God. We've got to get this, uh, get this world into a condition that we can make it an offering to God instead of allowing it to fall to pieces as a result of our own ignorance. So each person must now begin to think about developing value. One way to develop value, is, of course, is to be exposed to it. And there must be major changes in education. We can demand those changes and get them. All we have to do is stand together. But what happens? When we get together to make changes of this kind, one group says do that, another group says don't do that, and a third group says let it alone. There are people who feel that what the information they are getting now is what they want. So they get it and die. The, what they want brings them to bankruptcy, but it's, they don't want to change. They do not want to alter the rules for fear that they will be penalized, that they won't have quite the same chance for wealth and fame and fun as the individual who keeps the rules as they are and dies in early life as a narcotic addict. So to get education on its feet is not an easy problem. It must be faced by the real, with the realization that a basic of education must be found. It must be found in a way that does not hurt anyone. It must be of common agreement. Now we have in the world, for example, today, eight fairly major world religions. And we have a do couple of dozen smaller ones. The only thing that these religions have found uh, that they more or less all accept is the golden rule. They all believe in the golden rule. If you find it in Chinese and you'll find it in the Balinese calendars, you'll find it among the American Indians and you'll find it among the Eskimos. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now this is a common, common acceptance. It would be very hard to find anyone who would make a big argument against it. But no one is doing anything to bring it home to young people starting out in life. It is considered religious interference with the po political right to destroy the country. We do not want to have anything interfere with a smug situation. We don't have to interfere with it. It's falling apart itself. But no one seems to want to admit this. But with certain amount of ethics given to the young, we can prevent their children from being in the same jam that they are themselves in at the present time. We have got to build an ethic that is commonly acceptable. And having built it, we've got to live it. If we want to live by the golden rule, we must grant the right to do unto others only that which we would have them do unto us. Now, it may not be the same type of transaction, but the moral values must be consistent. If we realize this firmly and directly, we will have a much easier time working with young people. Now, there is a move in the educational world as a result of, of pan-educational relationships. We are becoming more and more aware of the religious systems of other countries, other religions, and other beliefs. Little by little, we are being exposed to the fact that there is not just one small circle of salvation and the rest is all headed for damnation. We are beginning to, eat, to eat, even accept the fact that some other religions might not be too bad. We must become aware of the fact that religions have a part to play in this 
and every culture, including the present, that has outlawed them has been in trouble. Now it may be that somebody's religion doesn't please somebody else. The main question isn't who it pleases, it is the question as what type of belief helps the individual to be a better person. This is the primary consideration, is the spiritual support to moral ethics. We need to have all the support we can get. And in the, if the belief in God gives us that support, we have a right to it. And if we do have it, no one has a right to question it. But we have no right to force other people to our beliefs. This has been one of the great problems in religion, is its constant effort to proselyte, in which each religion has gone back into a holy war, trying to convert some other religion. In the nature, this is all very foolish. In the great vista of those little stars that go on beyond the scope of human imagination, who knows who is what? All we know is that a divine law governs all things, and it is a good plan for us to find out what that law is and administer it rather than contradicting each other as to what it means. So religion is important in this. It is very important to young people because at the present time, young people have nothing right to do. To gather night after night to listen to hard rock is not worthy of the human being. It is also medically dangerous. It is a mistake all the way through. And yet these young people would probably be martyrs rather than to permit it to change. They want to do it their way because they do not know anything better to do. They see what their ancestors have done and don't like that. They fear what someone in the future might do, and they don't like that. So at the present moment, they are destroying themselves to escape the past and the future. We need something from these young people. After all, they are our successors. They are the ones who must take care of things when we're gone. And it's going to be very difficult to run this world with a rock concert. We're going to have to do better than that. We also have to find a way of educating young people so that if responsibilities are offered to them, they know how to accept them. At the present time, no growth is regarded as necessary because commuters are go uh, computers are going to run the world. We're all going to be do, do nothing but listen to the computer. Then we will be very, very definitely at the end of our possibilities of human civilization. Because if the computer goes far enough, it is a scientific discovery. If it goes far enough, it is going to finally end up in ethics. Because the universe is. Before it's over, the computer will have to teach us to live straight. Even though it may be a hard lesson and a long time coming. Because computers have to be correct mathematically and scientifically or they don't work. And anything that is correct scientifically and mathematically and works participates in a divine plan. Otherwise, it couldn't exist. So we have the problem of these young people. There's no jobs for them. The kindly older generation has thrown, un thrown unemployment in the face of millions. There is no cooperation. There is no tenderness. There's no thoughtfulness. All of it goes back to that one foundation, profit. And profit in this case is not profit as the, in the form of a wise man. It is a quick money deal. So actually, it's up to us. We've either got to straighten out or we're going to be in trouble. And this trouble can be very fatal because the mental and emotional attitudes of peoples the wars they fight, the depressions they cause, the strikes that they advance. All of these things are part of nature's vibratory field. And if we keep on thinking crazy as we are now, we will have a great rash of earthquakes. And we will have one tidal wave after another and one storm after another in an effort to clear the atmosphere of the material we are putting into it. We are filled with smog, we are overloaded with everything you can think of, and we go along without even a thought of the consequences. 
even though these conditions are shortening our own life expectancy, that's the way it is, anything rather than become an unselfish, intelligent human being. That's just too much to ask. We've been taught out of that. So we're going to have to pay according to what we have taught ourselves by ignoring natural law. We have today also a very grave problem that involves various types of health. Health is a very important thing. Health is a, a planet can be sick. The solar system can be sick. Little worms can be sick. Everything that exists can be sick if its proper regime is destroyed. A planet can be so ill that it will give us another mass of plague, plagues. We've had one civilization after another shaken from our backs already. We can have all kinds of troubles arising from mass concentration of negative, destructive thinking. And we can be destroyed not because the thinking is nasty, but because it is selfish, self-centered, and ambitious without any basic integrities to protect it. So we have to kind of think in terms of health. We know from the medical researches of today that many of the ailments that we all suffer from are due primarily to pollution in the air, adulteration in the food, and the definite effort to make things more palatable and less useful. Also, the great problem of profit. Behind nearly every state that we know, every condition we create, is the factor of profit. That we've got, we don't need that right now. Because what are we going to do with it? So, supposing we do make a few million. Well, not pleasant thought. Within control, if we've earned it. But what do, ha what do we actually have? We have something, and the first time we get a bad infection, we may have nothing. We can't take it with us. Most of our descendants are hardly good recipients. We don't know what to do with it, so we give it to something else in the hope they'll do better with it. But we have put such restraints on that other thing that it can't function either. So we have a tremendous grasp of wealth. We just practically uh, become convulsive when we hear of some of the salaries that are granted way out of proportion to value. But uh, we don't do anything to change the pattern except hope that we'll be one of those that gets the salary someday. If we could only become a little more like we were. I can remember back, quite a ways now, I can remember back to the time when people had homes, that they took care of their elders. Nobody with a family expected an elder to go into a retirement home. And as a result of that, they had a very useful elder who helped them in everything that they needed to do. I know several cases now in which families are being held together by a, an elder. I know now why some of these people are respected and honored. But now what we want is freedom. We want fun. Responsibility detracts from fun. We don't care how the person you take away from other home is going to feel about it. That's their business. We want no responsibilities. And then not having any responsibilities, we suddenly find that we are restricted. We suffer as the result of our effort to gain freedom. I know several instances in which an elder is now holding together an entire family and giving them freedoms and privileges they could never have otherwise. That was the way it was when we started out in life, but it's now become almost inevitable. Whether you've got to put anybody who isn't right up on top someplace so we don't have to watch them all the time. This type of thinking is part of a tremendous fun move. Now, what is fun? Well, fun is a very difficult word to uh, analyze. If we mean, think it means humor, we have it every night in television and it's pretty bad. If, if, if by humor we mean editorials, 
most of them are depending on sarcasm for their popularity. We are not having any fun. That's the trouble. We are spending vast amounts of money for alcohol and trying to drive home intoxicated, have an accident, and have an enormous lawsuit on our hands. Why should we do these things? We know they happen. We read them in the paper every day. And yet we keep on doing just the same thing. We know that our narcotics addict is a very poor candidate for recovery. That it will be very difficult to get some of them where they can even be useful anymore. And yet nobody does anything about it. Free country, if you want to become an addict, you become an addict. And now the, addi the uh, uh, various bureaus and boards trying to control the situation have come to the conclusion that they can't control it. No one can control the narcotics unless it's the people who buy it. And if we stopped buying it, there wouldn't be any narcotic traffic. But we many too many people, particularly younger people, do not realize that they are the ones that are causing the problem and not the merchant. There is no narcotics addiction to the individual who won't buy it. But we haven't taught them not to buy it, or perhaps we have not given them any opportunity to do something more interesting. With a bit of heroin or cocaine, they feel six or ten feet high. They have a, a high and a low. And this situation is a complete illusion, a delusion. Why are not these young people doing things that are meaningful? Why are they not having fun out of growing, out of becoming better people and making a better world? Nobody gets around to doing it. So now we're coming to the end of an old cycle. We're coming to an end of it because it's falling apart, not that we're basically trying to solve it. But in the emergency, we are beginning to think. In the emergency, we are beginning to realize that things must change. And an off order of change is coming. There is today more growth in the fields of religion, philosophy, idealism, and mysticism than ever before in recorded history. People want to grow. They want to be better. And they are studying to be better. But unfortunately, they have not realized that, that they must change themselves. It isn't the class they attend or the book they read. It is what they themselves do to change their own dispositions. There is no reason to hope that any intellectualism apart from labor can ever help to cure, cure this situation. The individual who wants to make a better world has got to be a better person to start with. He's got to start in by understanding life and recognizing his own faults and his own delinquencies and get out and cooperate constructively with other people who are going somewhere. Now in this struggle to try to find some solutions, we're getting some pretty woolly ones. And some of these solutions will probably fall apart also. But at the least point of view, they are efforts. And now we've got to help them to build a solid substance under the effort to grow. We've got to help them to find the truths about things. We've got to have them realize that growth is a private, personal problem. And if pe several people go come together to try to grow together, they may do so in fraternity, but each has got to do his own living. He's got to do his own thinking. He's got to make his own corrections with life. He's going to have to find ways to cut down the divorce rate. He's going to have to find ways in to improve morality and social life. And in all these matters, the improvement begins with himself. Until he grows, until he becomes better, there is no actual change. There is talk, there's discussion, there's publication of books, there's magazine articles, there's everything you think of. But unless the person grows, unless he makes a purpose out of improving himself, unless he stops hating people, unless he stops gossip, unless he stops chiseling, dishonesty, unless he stops trying to make an unreasonable profit on his merchandise, unless these things change, all the illusions in the world will not help. Age by changing a life your own. To change the way you relate to all the circumstances of living. How you relate to government, how you relate to religion, science, 
how you relate to the professions, and how thoughtful and conscientiously you escape the tendencies to bigotry which arise in nearly every person. We've got to gradually grow the way we should. Now, if we do that between now and the end of the century, I think we'll be on our way to the greatest change the world has ever known. And it is being forced on us by the fact that our skills are becoming auto-destructive. We are, uh, in, we are thinking our way into a dilemma which we cannot escape from unless we change our own thinking. We are le le heading into a way of life that is intolerable unless we change it. We are heading into a period of change which is going to result either in the building of a better civilization than we've ever known or will bring down the present in ruin. We have to get together and do some solid, simple, honest thinking. It's tough, it's not popular, but it's survival. Now most people care for someone in this world. They care for their children, their parents, their marital, marital partner. They want to have a happier situation. This means they've got to cause it. They've got to begin to change the dispositional peculiarities of themselves and become more integrated and better people. I've had a great many come to me during these many years with their problems. Some of them just only wanted sympathy. Well, that's not very valuable, but if you can pat them on the head and call it that, but it's not going to change anything. A few wanted to change themselves. And one man came to me and said he was on the verge of losing his home, very largely because of his own conduct. What could he do about it? I told him what I thought he could do about it and save the home. And in desperation, he tried it and saved the home. And the home that he expected to lose in a few months has now gone on for over 20 years. It's to do things, to get at things. Uh, sometimes you use strange medicines for these cases. In those periods when there was a lot of peace and not much war, and those periods are getting scarce now, uh, a young man came to me who was a definite drifter. He had no leadership. His parents, he didn't even know where they were. He wasn't trained in anything. He was gradually becoming an alcoholic, and he was gradually going down to join that group of people who might uh, haunt, the, haunt the east end of hey, uh, some town, such as San Francisco, uh, streets there where there's awful troubles. But in any event, we talked to him, and I said to him, there's one thing you can do, you're not going to like it, but you can do it. Join the Marines. He did. He stayed for one re-enlistment, and at the end of five years, he came back. And I saw him come in the door, I saw a man. I saw a person with real integrities, with a profession, with a straight mind, off of all alcohol, he was, a, he was disciplined into being a human being. And of course, it was, I picked a time when there wasn't any war, so he wasn't worried much about that. But he had to obey orders. He had to do things on time. He had to clean up his own room. He had to have a certain pride in achievement and accomplishment. And he got it out of the Marine Corps. A lot of young people could get it out of the homes if the parents would give them some discipline but no it's too much trouble the parents don't want to even have an argument with their own children the result is that no discipline is resulting in the inability of the person to learn he doesn't want to take the time and if somebody does do it and does take the time he is labeled a highbrow and regarded with disfavor Anyone that tries hard is going to be criticized for trying. But if that's the best cause of criticism, I know, is the criticism for doing it better. So if we have another ten years, maybe, a little more, we can put this world back on its feet. We are gradually increasing the influences for better conditions. 
Little by little, real government leaders are beginning to become involved in this realization. Most of the governments of the world today are in trouble and they know it. And they have a pretty good idea why they're in trouble. Of course, some of them are in trouble and in a very poor condition at the moment to get out of it. But every one of these troubled peoples knows that something has to change. There has to be an entirely new way of life in which the ends of living are not material conquest or material wealth, but the fulfillment of the personal potential of the human being. We've got to build a world that is ruled in effect by affections and friendship, by mutual trust and cooperation for survival and for general improvement. We know now that all this nationalism is simply a pre pretense to perpetuate someone's selfishness or, ar or arrogance. We know that all these systems are for profit of some kind and not for principle. And people themselves are finding out. And everywhere there are disturbances. Now, unfortunately, the first disturbance is a violence. And this is very, very wrong. Because that will solve nothing either. It is not to be violent and not to attack your enemy that will get you somewhere or hold hostages. The thing that helps the person to be free from the slavery which he has imposed upon himself is the development of his own potential. Development of his own principles so that he can stand and say that he is a person and that he cannot be enslaved except by his own permission. And if he has to go through various stages of subordination because of politics around him, this does not interfere at any time with the right to be himself. He may not be able to advertise it, he doesn't have to. All he has to do is practice it. And very few people are in trouble politically because they practice principles, unless the principles are wrong. They can be quietly practiced by anyone. Three or four religions can live under one roof. Each one practices their own without conflict with the others. All the conflicts that we have are largely based upon uh, superstitions, upon misinformations, or we have accepted the conduct of people as the indication of their religion. And if their conduct is impossible, we consider their faith intolerable. All these things can be changed. And we can set up new educational methods by which a great deal of this problem can be corrected. We do not need to bring theology into the public schools, but we do need to have a basic integrity and an idealism that is generally accepted. We do not need to favor one group above another, but we have a right to tell the person that as education is costly and is paid for by the government or by whatever ser service does it, that the student is responsible for growing and learning. And if he does not find growth and learning in the existing educational system, then he can search it for it elsewhere. He does not have to go along to be cut out as a paper doll in some system. We need to have more intelligence and more thinking. And uh, we also need to have willingness to arbitrate differences. Now, we have a, a number of different groups that are trying to do these things. Each of these groups is very largely centered around a personality. This is not good. The group's progress should be centered around the supreme reality of truth. There are no real leaders in this world. There are only some who are a step ahead, that's all. Everyone is in servitude to the realities of the universe. We all must obey the same rules, whether we are so-called exalted or so-called inferior. There is no one who is able to administer the universe except the universe itself. And somewhere out there, there is a power, a power that has always been, a power that seemingly never makes a mistake, a power that can do just as much with the eye of a flea as it does with the completion of the solar system. A power that deals in the miniature and the massive. A power that sets planets in orbit and takes care of the smallest blade of grass. There is a great rule 
And that rule is infinitely benevolent. That rule is a rule of enlightened love. It is a rule of something that will forever be parental, forever guarding and preserving and helping. And those who want to have the best life are the ones who want to live according to that rule and help it. And wherever something interferes with the proper function of the rights of human beings or the rights of other creatures, then something must be done about it. And the only thing we can do is make sure that we're not making any of those mistakes. Now we're gradually going to see the new major movements are going to come up. Some of them international, some of them largely uh, sufficient to regain our respect. We may not want to join all of these things because it doesn't do any good particularly. But we are going to be with that which is right. And we're going to stand strong and firm for the realities that transcend prejudice of all kinds. We're not going to be dominated by prejudice, by the unwillingness to accept a belief because it comes from the wrong source. There is only one source for right belief, and that is the divine power. There's only one source for bad advice, and that's humanity. And we have to correct this as rapidly as we possibly can. So I think we all should make a, not a five-year plan in this case, but a ten-year plan. A ten-year plan in which we declare that at the end of ten years we're going to be better people than we are now. Really better people. We're going to be able to say at the end of ten years, I'm jealous of no one. And I may be able to say at the end of ten years, I believe all religions have the right to exist, and I really believe it. It's not merely a platitude. And I'd be perfectly wish willing to worship in any man's altar. Because all in the last run lead to the same great immutable principle. All religions are efforts to find the nature of truth and the nature of the beauty that we all admire. We're not going to have any more family feuds because family is part of the divine plan. We are in families because it is necessary. It is part of the ordination. And if we cannot maintain a family, we cannot maintain a world. If all our families have to end in divorce, it means that all our, ide our idealism is going down to defeat. We're going to make things work. And we're going to do it not by forcing our will upon others, but by sharing with others in the natural service of those things which are honorable and right. We are going to gradually also enlighten ourselves. We're not going to have time enough to waste on very, very insipid radio or television programs. We're going to be out trying to learn more. We want to become better informed. We want to understand the sources of our culture. We want to know what happens when people make mistakes. We want to know why we had an inquisition and why we could have another one. We want to know also why we had had religious wars from the beginning. We might have another one. But not if we think right. Not if we live right. Not if we take religion out of the book and put it in our hearts where it belongs. We may never call it anything, but if it makes us better people, it is true faith. So we know these things can be done, but they've got to be done by us. We cannot wait for the great changes in society. Society is locked in its own mistakes. And as these mistakes spread, we're going to find more and more trouble. And we're going to realize the inhumanity of man to man. We're going to realize how people go out and kill each other. Murder men, women, and children for what? They don't even know what. It is just that they hate something. And when you hate, it is simply means that love has failed. And all hate is death. And love is life. We have to gradually get over the belief that we can win a war. No one can win a war and we don't need to. What we want to do is win the peace. And to do that, we've got to practice it ourselves. We are getting to the point where we can't afford a war. Our nuclear weaponry is past human credibility. Even those who have helped to build this nuclear uh, artillery are suddenly realizing that they will be among the first victims. 
there's suddenly a realization that it is no longer possible for humanity to win a major war. All we can do is leave a desert planet floating in a dead orbit in space. We suddenly realize that if we have any desire to survive, we've got to grow. We've got to find ways of understanding each other rather than exterminating the people we don't like. We're going to have to find ways of understanding their language, understanding their dreams, understanding their ideals and their hopes and their visions. We've got to make something out of this that is going to really make a better world. If we do not, we are not going to have too many more chances. We're also going to realize that all this type of thing, that finally the great oracle, the great Sibylline mystery, is in our own hearts. It is inside of ourselves that abides the sacred truths we all need to realize. We know in our souls what is right, but we will not let our souls speak. We are very careful to prevent it. We do everything we can to prevent the inner life from shining through to help to guide us. We have covered it with prejudice, we've covered it with selfishness, and we've covered it with ulterior motives. We are afraid to feel and think according to the divine plan. We are afraid to bestow our love for fear it will be abused. Maybe it will be. But the great virtue lies in the loving and not in the being loved. We do not have to worry whether we are appreciated or not. We've got to stay with the truth. We've got to stay with principles that are bigger than people. And if we can't find the people, we've still got to live the principles. Now one of the things that we hope for is that a series of conferences and commissions will show the general public in many countries the direction that has come out of a little mature thinking. We are going to realize that most of this mature thinking has originated in powerful military countries. That, this is a, that they have the, developed an armament or a system of aggressive militarism over a period of years. But suddenly, something is happening. Maybe it's because they're getting a little tired, or maybe it's because as they get older, their ideas of conquering the physical world lessen. But in any event, these powers are now begging for arbitration. They don't want to go on with this. And in that moment of conscience, perhaps a little something has come into their hearts or souls that what they are doing is not only a sin against humanity, but a sin against space itself. We are also finding that we can't do this and we can't do that. The smog is closing in. The ozone layers of the atmosphere are thinning. Our natural resources are diminishing. And yet we are wasting them every day without any hope of replacing them. Nations that were very extravagant in the use of fuels for, for military purposes are beginning to realize that this little bottle which we call the planet can be empty someday and then there will be no advantage in all this vast array of me mechanical and uh, military strength. So that uh, for the first time leading powers are afraid. They are sufficiently afraid to even speak to each other. They are frightened of the possibility that some may strange and mysterious circumstance may set off an unwinnable situation that we could, with almost in 24 hours, destroy the work of 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. And nobody really wants to be the one to do that. They would like to get rid of somebody, take what he has, and keep the thing going the way it is. They want to act as uh, not bandits or brigands but they do not want to destroy the main chance now they discover that the little brigand and the big brigand are both the same both equally dangerous so we are beginning to talk in terms that indicate that now if people will really get together and do some solid thinking that they can influence nearly any form of government they wish to they can influence the sciences. 
They can influence the arts. They can tell whether we spend money for our various paintings and sculpturings and architectural masterpieces. They can also tell us what we should pay for our medical bills. They can tell us all these things and we will believe them and we will ultimately meet them because the individual will demand integrity in his public servants, also in his professions, also in his guarantees and in his advertising. We can demand these things. We can get the changes in the advertising any time we decide not to buy the product that is falsely advertised. We can censor all these things ourselves. And we have to. Conditions cannot be changed uh, by the group. Conditions must be changed from within the individual himself. And he can do it. And we can all do it. And we can start with some small thing in which we can gain a certain pride for having done it a little better. We don't need to upset everything we know in one minute, but we can start gradually civilizing ourselves. We can start gradually demanding the values which we hear about but seldom see. We can simply boycott what we do not believe. We can simply demand improvements in various things and the moment this demand is backed by a reduction in profits, the uh, service will be reorganized. We're having the same problem with uh, cigarette smoking. We're having it with everything. But there is a strong increasing demand for health. There's going to go into the food processing. It's going to go into everything. And we can have what we want. And what we deserve is what we're going to get. So we better start deserving what we should have. Well, that's quite a sentence, old man. Uh, I don't know how I worked that one out, but I guess it's all right. But we can do these things. We have the right. The one thing they can't do is take away from us the right not to spend what we have. We do not have to pour it in just because they invite us to. And almost every field from entertainment to education can be altered very rapidly by the discrimination of the public, by the determination to have things better. And out of all this together will come perhaps something that we have a right to consider as worthwhile. In ancient times, the peoples of the old religions brought to the altars of their gods the first of the flock, the best of everything, the greatest of the treasures, the greatest of the thinkers, and the most devout of the worshippers. They brought their hearts and souls to the altars of their gods, and these uh, offerings were acceptable unto the Most High. And these offerings were that the people gave themselves to their God. They didn't give themselves to be burned on an altar, but they gave themselves as a living instrument to be used by the divine purpose. They gave their hearts and their minds to the service of humanity, to the service of truth, and to the advancement of the divine plan in the mortal world. And this is the way it has to be. And this is the way it should be done. And this is the way we're all going to do it if we want it done. Otherwise, conditions will remain uncertain. There is also a possibility by simply studying the factors of some of these problems. I have a friend who travels very intensively. He's in the business of travel. And he has told me the conditions in most of the major cities of the world. That in practically every city of importance in the world, traffic is immovable. The tremendous amounts of travel nowadays in traffic, local traffic, is beyond estimation. Today we are burning more gasoline in a day than we used to burn in a year. But where is the supply? We think we've got some left. We probably have. At the present rate, we might have left enough to last another 50 years. But then what? Oh, then we use electricity. Well, how are we going to make the electricity? How are we going to control the sun enough to take the place of all that we're wasting? It's ever changing and changing, but never changing ourselves. We are going to find new ways of travel, but we're not going to find any reason why we shouldn't spend half our time on wheels. 
we are, we are not learning to conserve anything. We're going to wait till he runs out and try to find a substitute, and for a time we will. But this little bottle is not, has no genie in it. It cannot replace itself after we, we have destroyed its contents. And we might as well begin to realize that we can extend the utility of this planet for a long time if we recognize that we are cast away on an island. We are like Robinson Crusoe. We are left on a desert island where we have to build a world of our own. This was the concept of the New Atlantis. This was the concept of the Christianopolis and all the utopian literature of the 17th century. We are brought to an island in, the, in space and here we have to build a life. We have to find ways. We have to discover solutions. We have to learn to live with ourselves, which is one of the most difficult of all lessons to learn. But in the case of the earth, we're not only on an island, but we are on an island that is beautifully verdant. We are on the island in which nature is enriched. We are surrounded by thousands of other living things that are also trying to grow and unfold. We have found an island and land in its natural condition of extraordinary beauty. We find that an all-provident nature protects all this, that it makes it possible for things to be beautiful. It has given us so much of natural beauty, and we have destroyed so much of this with our own selfish, arbitrary conduct. There's no reason why we can't enjoy life. There's no reason why we cannot share with nature the bounties and wonders of existence. There is no reason why we can't develop beautiful and useful talents from within ourselves. We can lift our abilities from the brain trust to perhaps a heart doctrine. We can find fulfillment in growing and contributing to beauty. We can train our children up to be kind to each other and to be kind to the stranger at the gate. We can do all kinds of things if we can get over this hypnosis that we have fallen into, this slough of ambition and uh, greed and fun, we can do all kinds of things because we're not having any fun. No narcotic addict is having fun. He's having high and low and most of it torture. We're not having great success the way we're doing it. We just have a run on, the, on Wall Street, which doesn't help anybody very much, except certain persons who engineered it. But anyway, we have all these problems which we don't need. All we need is to settle down and grow. We can unfold the talents within ourselves. There is probably enough genius at this moment in the world to completely rebuild it. But we're never going to call for this genius. It's going to gradually die out unknown, unhonored, and unsung. We are not calling out from the interior to other people to release all they can give and would be likely to give to a good cause. We are satisfied to take up a collection. This is not the basic problem. Surely there has to be a collection. But the real gift is the gift of self to progress. And the gift, in, in most cases, is the gift of the human mind to the divine soul behind that mind. We can give ourselves to the God in us. We can buy no higher redemption than to release the power of the soul within us. We can serve God in us, the hope of glory. We can become proud to be servants in the everlasting house. We can do all the beautiful things that we want to do, but we don't even know they're beautiful. To us, anything that doesn't result in higher interest rates isn't beautiful. So we have interest rates that gradually grind us to death. All these things re result in the slavery. We are enslaved to a concept of life that is wrong. We are in servitude to a policy that failed 10,000 years ago and has failed a hundred times since. We do not realize that we are in slavery to an attitude 
to a policy, to a world acceptance of the worst. We remember that outside the wall of China, there was a battlefield 400 miles long. This was a war that came before the Christian era. We remember the gods that fought in, over the fields of Troy. We remember the Inquisition, the conquest of Napoleon, Caesar, and Alexander, the attempted conquest of Hitler and Mussolini. We know there was nothing but misery. There was nothing but sorrow, and people, under a mistaken concept of patriotism, went out and died for a dictator who had not in himself one moment of real understanding of human life. Let's stop doing this type of thing. Let's demand that our leaders try, at least, to help us to release the God in us until it becomes a powerful voice in the world. When the divine is released through man, his problems are solved. While he constantly tries to build institutions to take the place of his own character, he will be in trouble. And as long as he adulterates his dream with avarice and ambition, and jealousies, he's in trouble. So what we are looking for really is to get behind this movement that is coming so that it won't fail this time. That for the first time the whole world is thinking in terms of peace. One after another the nations are going to come into this. But they're going to need this of the support of each of us. The leader who, who wants to bring peace must speak for a people that wants peace. The individual who wants to get rid of crime by removing its cause must be backed by the people so that this voice is not one crying in the wilderness waiting for martyrdom. All these things can be done, but we've got to be with those that are trying to do them. We've got to be with those who believe in principles and try to apply them. And the only way we can do that is to release these principles in ourselves. The human soul is aware of the facts. The human soul has gone through many embodiments. It is perfectly aware of our problem. But whenever it tries to speak, it is shushed by the mind, or by the desires, or by the opportunities and uh, privileges of wrong attitudes. So. Until the soul governs the mind, the mind cannot build a good world. If the soul in the world can be created anew, if we can bring the soul out of nations, we will have peace. If we cannot do this, we will have continued struggle to the end of time. But uh, what opportunities we'll have in the future, hard to say. But I have a sneaky suspicion that this is going to be one of the last great opportunities before there is a really tragic breakdown. We are still in a condition to take care of the matter. We are in a condition to make enough changes for the better that we can adjust to a future with considerable hope and aspiration. But if we refuse this opportunity, in which over a hundred nations are working together to try to find a solution, if we don't put everything we have behind them, and help them in every way possible. If we can't end forever our intolerances and our impatiences and our jealousies and our tyrannies and get behind the answer, then we're going to have a little really serious trouble. And it's much better to very simply and honestly walk forward into the next century than it is to push, cram, and juggle figures and factors and personalities in a desperate effort to get there. So we really recommend that this is the time for peace. It is possible in our time. It's only possible, however, if we do it. And if we do not do it, no legislation in the world can do it. We can't legislate the control of the drug industry. We can't negotiate or legislate the problem of AIDS. These things we cannot meet with legislation. Integrity cannot be nominated and elected. None. Integrity is in the human soul itself and will come out if we give it a chance. 
but without our own integrity, no nations can be honorable or proper citizens of this world. So we hope that uh, on the simple fact that we can do it probably now better than in the last 500 years. Foundations laid 400 years ago can come out now. The mysteries and secret things that have been hidden for the ages can be brought into the surface and help us. But we've got to make the change ourselves. We've got to honestly labor for a better world. And we must be the first to make the sacrifices that are necessary for world peace and harmony and the security for our children and their children. The time of selfishness is gone. This is the time when for the first moment, I guess in 500 years, we have really realized that the world is in trouble and that this trouble is due to ourselves. And if we can solve this problem, giving values where they belong, giving help when it is necessary, we can probably most of us live to see a better world than we have ever known. But we've got to do it. We've got to do it ourselves through sacrifice, dedication, and a re resolution not to cooperate in any way with that which is dishonorable. Because most dishonor depends on the selfishness of little people to maintain its major projects. If people are honest, the world will be honest. And if the little people unite to demand the proper standard of values, they'll get it. And they'll finally realize that the reason God made so many little people is because they were necessary to take care of a few big ones who didn't have enough understanding and insight to protect themselves. Out of all of this comes also reforms in arts, sciences, business, economics. We will probably finally come back to the old socialistic idea of, pro of production for use and not for profit. All these things will be modified, but there'll be a part in it somewhere. We will be back to the thinking of the great Greek scholars and others of that period, that the only answer to the suffering of mankind is to find out what causes suffering. And the cause of suffering is abuse of something, abuse of self, abuse of others or abuse of natural resources when we correct this thing do that which is right and proper we'll have a pretty good world to live in and I'd like to hope that we'll all be able to gather someday and welcome in an age of fraternity an age of brotherhood in which there will be no longer any strangers in this world but only friends thank you